The objective of this video is to use the magnetic circuit analysis tools that we previously introduced to derive the equivalent circuit of a transformer. So if you go back to the very beginning of this class when we introduced the single phase rectifier, we also introduced the equivalent circuit of a transformer. And at that point, we had just simply stated that it came from previous courses that you had taken. At this point in the class, it will be useful to refresh yourselves on this equivalent circuit and then actually talk about the physics behind it where it comes from. Because in our next lecture, we're going to talk about designing transformers, and we want to have a physical basis for the design decisions that we make. So we're going to peel back the onion, so to speak. We're going to delve deeper and drive the equivalent circuit using Ampere's law and Faraday's law. So you'll notice that on the right-hand side of your screen, I have sketched a simple transformer figure. This transformer has two coils, a primary coil with an input current labeled as IP and an input voltage labeled as VP. And the secondary side has a current labeled IS coming out of it and a voltage across the terminals labeled as VS. I want to point out that the direction of the currents is a deliberate decision. Uh, it would be more general to draw both currents going into the core so that the, the flux links both coils the same way. However, in power circuits, we're nominally flowing power from one direction to another, and so the convention is to draw the primary current as entering the transformer and the secondary current as leaving the transformer. However, realize that this is just a simple uh, decision regarding nomenclature. You could have reversed these directions, and you just have to adjust your analysis accordingly. So let's begin. And we're going to start by assuming that we have no leakage fluxes. And if you'll recall, recall at the end of our last video, we define leakage flux as a flux that's partially or completely in the air rather than being completely in the core. So in this problem, we're going to assume that all of the flux, all of the field lines, stay within the core of the transformer. That means that all of the field lines that link a turn of our primary coil also link a turn of our secondary coil. And while this is kind of an idealized assumption, it isn't actually that overly constraining. We can always add in the effects of leakage fluxes by considering an inductance in series with either coil. Since leakage flux doesn't couple between the two coils, it doesn't actually matter for driving the equivalent circuit of the transformer. We can just add it as an after effect by placing inductances in series with each coil. So we'll start analysis by assuming no leakage flux. And we're going to begin along the lines of what we were developing in our last video, which is using Ampere's law to find the total flux in our core. And using the assumptions that we talked about last time, that h doesn't vary along a length, we can bring both h and our mean path, flux path to length out of this integral and set it equal to the current that the integral encloses. So we're evaluating along this closed loop path, which is labeled in the, the dashed black line. And we've you'll notice that we've picked a direction for this path. We have an arrow here that indicates the direction. And you can relate this direction to the direction of your current by using the right hand rule. It's too hard to show this in the video, but we'll talk about this briefly at the beginning of class. The right hand rule states that if you allow your fingers to follow the, the direction of the current. So if you imagine your fist clenching the core in the direction the current is flowing in your primary coil, your thumb points in the direction that a positive current will create a positive flux. And so you'll notice that our primary current and our secondary current try to create fluxes in opposite directions. And so using this rule, we can write that the total current enclosed is going to be equal to our primary current times the number of primary turns minus our secondary current times the number of secondary turns. And let's label our turns on this drawing as well. And we talked about this briefly last time, but it can be helpful to illustrate this by drawing the core again and then using the symbol for current going in and out of the page to replace each of the conductors that we see in this 2D cross section. So if we do this, we get the following. We can see that following the convention that we've labeled up here, all of our primary turns appear as going into the page, while all of our secondary turns appear as coming out of the page. 
assuming that a current is flowing in the direction that's labeled by the arrows for IS and IP. So our first step was to apply Ampere's law. And we can rewrite this to an expression for H. Next, we're going to make use of the relation between our magnetic field and our H field. Then we can calculate the total flux by using the assumption we made last time, which is that our field is constant over a cross section. So we're multiplying our magnetic field times the cross-sectional area of our core, which we've labeled over here, to get our total flux. And then we can put this in terms of the magnetic equivalent circuit that we derived last time by recalling that reluctance is equal to the length of a flux path divided by the permeability of that path and the, the cross-sectional area of that path. And we finally have an expression for the flux in our core in terms of the MMF of each coil, NPIP, and MSIS, and the reluctance of our core, which depended only on the geometric properties and material properties of the core, that is, its mean path length, its cross-sectional area, and its magnetic permeability. So we can actually sketch this magnetic equivalent circuit as being two MMF sources connected via a reluctance, which is our core reluctance. And if you solve this circuit, you will get the total core flux, phi. So we now have the total flux in our core. That is, the total flux that is taking this path and that links a turn of each of the coils. But we have a little bit more work to do before we can get to equivalent circuit parameters. So we'll write this in terms of the flux linkage for each coil. The total flux linking the primary coil is going to be the number of turns of the primary coil times the flux in the core. And we can do a little bit of mathematics to get this in terms of what we call a magnetizing inductance and a magnetizing current. So if we pull NP out of this expression here, we end up getting this in terms of, of what we're going to define as a magnetizing inductance and a magnetizing current. And this magnetizing inductance and magnetizing current is in a way a mathematical construct, but you're going to see that it becomes very helpful for constructing the equivalent circuit. So at least at this point, you can follow the algebra. You can see that indeed the flux linking our primary coil is equal to NP times phi. So it's equal to the number of turns of our primary coil times the flux that's in the core of our transformer. And we used our expression for the flux in our transformer within this to get this expression here. And then we pulled NP out of it so that we got this term right here, which is clearly an inductance based on our, lecture, our last video, which, which calculated inductances. And then this term right here, which we're defining as an equivalent current. So we say that we've got a magnetizing inductance and a magnetizing current, which are two mathematical quantities that we defined. And then we can also write an expression for the flux linkage of our secondary coil as ns times phi, and we can note that it is in fact then equal to ns over np times lambda p. And we reach, we reach this conclusion out here that's equal to ns by np times lambda p because we solved lambda p equals np times phi. So we just wrote the expression for the flux linking our secondary coil in terms of the flux linking our primary coil. All right, so we've set the stage now. We're going to use Faraday's law to finish solving the circuit equations or to finish creating the circuit equations. That is, we're gonna use Faraday's law to find our voltage terms. So we've got current terms, we've got um, flux linkages in terms of currents, and now we're gonna use Faraday's law to get voltages, because circuits consist of voltages and currents. So our primary voltage is equal to d lambda dt, which is straight from Faraday's law. Faraday's law says a voltage is equal to the derivative of, our, of a flux. And since we're talking about a coil, we have a number of turns. So we say that the voltage is equal to the derivative of our flux linkage with respect to time. And if we differentiate 
our flux linkage expression up here, we can see that it just becomes equal to lm dim dt. So this means that the primary side of our transformer equivalent circuit is simply equal to an inductance with a magnetizing current flowing through it. And we can start to sketch that below. So if we have a terminal here that our primary current is coming into, we're going to define this path down here as carrying our magnetizing current, which means we need to place a current source here that accounts for our magnetizing current. So if we want to get our magnetizing current, it's equal to our primary current minus ns by np times is. So we've got our primary current, and we need to now subtract ns by np times is. And so clearly, if we connect this, and then we place our magnetizing inductance. So clearly, we can now see that im is equal to ip minus ns by np times is which matches our expression up above. And we can see that the voltage across this, Vs, is going to be equal to Lm times Di dt. It's going to equal to the voltage across that inductance, just using the inductance equation. So we've got part of the circuit done. Now we need to consider the voltage expression for the secondary. So we're going to differentiate lambda s with respect to time, and we have an expression for lambda s above, and since the turns ratio does not change with time, we can see that this is simply equal to d lambda p dt, which is therefore equal to ns by np times our primary voltage. So we now have all the information we need to finish the circuit. We have our primary side over here, and then we'll add our secondary side to the right, and it will consist of a dependent voltage source of ns by np times v primary. So we've now taken the equations that we derived here, which came from applying Ampere's law and Faraday's law to this transformer. So we've taken this transformer, applied Ampere's law and Faraday's law, and we've come up with these voltage and current expressions. And then we have just massaged those voltage and current expressions to get them into the form of an equivalent circuit. And we can now make our equivalent circuit more detailed if we want. Uh, we can simply add, for example, a leakage inductance. And we can acknowledge the resistance of the winding by adding a resistor until we get a full-fledged model. And if you go back in your notes and you compare this to what we talked about on the first day of class, you can see that this matches our, discu our discussion. At that point, we'd, we had denoted a turns ratio as simply being 1 to n, where n was a normalized quantity. So we had described an ideal transformer as being having a turns ratio of 1 to n. Well, in this case, we acknowledge that each side of the transformer has an actual number of turns, np on the primary and ns on the secondary. This is our complete equivalent circuit. few things to note. So IM, our magnetizing current, doesn't serve much of a purpose in terms of the ideal transformer operation. In fact, IM is strictly used to establish the field in the magnetic core. And if we had an ideal transformer, we would say that the permeability of the core material would be infinity. That is, it'd be it correspond to a superconductor in an electric circuit analogy. It would not take any MMF in order to induce a field in our core. And if we review what this would do to our derivation, that means that our reluctance would actually be zero, which would mean that our inductance, which is equal to n squared over our reluctance, would be infinity. By viewing our equivalent circuit, we can see that that would mean that our magnetizing current would always be zero. And that's a good thing, because if you have a magnetizing current, that means that even when you are drawing no secondary current, you still require current in your primary. And think about this, you know this intuitively. If you take a transformer, you, if you take a transformer and you connect it to AC voltage, 
and you don't connect the secondary to anything, you will see a current being drawn on the input side. The current will have a very low power factor. In fact, if it has no resistance, the power factor will actually be zero. And the current is just a result of that magnetizing inductance in this equivalent circuit, as well as the leakage inductance. If your magnetizing inductance was infinity, you'd have an infinite impedance and you would see no current in that equivalent circuit. So a good transformer is a transformer that has a very high magnetizing inductance. And the other thing that I want to note as a housekeeping item is that we can actually calculate phi in two ways. So we can calculate the total flux in our core in two ways. And you've actually been practicing both methods all along in this course. But it's nice to point it out uh, when viewed to the paradigm we've been developing in the last couple of videos. So the first method is using Ampere's law. And that's what we've been focusing on in these videos, in the last couple of videos. And Ampere's law uses current as an input. When you do analysis based on Ampere's law, you're evaluating the integral of, of h dot dl and you're using b equals mu h and then phi equals b times a cross-sectional area and then a flux linkage is equal to a number of turns times your flux in order to get an expression for the flux linkage in terms of your inductance and your current. So again, your current is your input. You can also use Faraday's law. So while well, Ampere's law uses current as the input, Faraday's law uses voltage as the input. And Faraday's law says that voltage is equal to d lambda dt. And we can integrate this to get lambda as a function of voltage. So we use this expression when we're talking about current ripple. We called this term our volt second. And we would divide it by inductance in order to get current ripple. If you don't divide it by inductance, you end up getting flux ripple. So the bottom line is that we have two ways to calculate these quantities, but both ways have to be true. We, we have to be able to satisfy both laws. These are fundamental properties of physics. And a lot of what we're doing when we, when we do magnetic circuit analysis is thinking about satisfying these laws, imposing these laws in order to allow us to calculate the field quantities and the current quantities and the flux linkage quantities and the voltages. So in summary, this video has taken the magnetic circuit analysis tools that we derived in our previous video and used these tools to create the electric equivalent circuit of a transformer. And key expressions that we defined were the magnetizing inductance for a transformer and the magnetizing current of a transformer. We then use these expressions with Faraday's law in order to get voltage expressions for our transformer. And then we sketched the circuit that implements those voltage and current relationships. And we found that it matched the equivalent circuit that we'd been considering at the beginning of the course. We then commented on how we desire to reduce our magnetizing current to as small a value as possible, that a good transformer design has a small magnetizing current because it will lead to less losses and a smaller transformer size. And then we commented on how we must always be able to satisfy both Ampere's law and Faraday's law when analyzing our magnetic circuits and how we've actually been using both of these expressions throughout the course in terms of inductance and current and the integral of voltage. But now we're using them explicitly based on field quantities.